Welcome to Hill Talk Tuesdays with Lisa, where transformation begins as we evoke, embrace, and evolve. Greetings, 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 and welcome to Real Talk Tuesdays with Lisa. Today, not only I am excited, but I am honored to have Lady Jen Duplessis with us today. Hi, Jen. Hi there. I am delighted to be here today. This is a long time coming, right? (laughs) Delighted to be here, delighted to be able to share as much as I can in the time we have together. Beautiful. Well, we are ending the year Mm -hmm. with you and I can't think of any other, um, any other interview that I would have had this season (laughs) ending the season with because you are one seasoned lady oh gosh thank you I am (laughs) I am (laughs) so I want to take a moment and introduce Lady Jen Duplessis who is a leading expert in building world-class teams she's worked in high achieving corporations leaders and entrepreneurs and who has struck Oh, we're not on Facebook? Why not? We're not live. We're live somewhere. We are live somewhere, but I asked it to go on Facebook. (laughs) Why are we not live? Why are we not live on Facebook? It says we are live on Facebook. It says we're live. I don't know where. Oh, this is always fun, you know. So if we still are live on Facebook, hi, everybody. We'll figure it out. Okay. Never mind. Because what you um, see is what you get. This is who we are. Actually, hold on a second. I know what is wrong. And uh-huh. I'm going to go in here. I just found what is wrong. And apparently, we are not. I don't see it. How do I say we have to go live oh. public? Yeah, how are we live and not live? We're live somewhere. We are live, but I need to edit live being public profile status, and it's not live public. <laughs> this happens every time. It's like, you know where what? do I you know what happened to me? And, and if we are live and people are hearing it, you know what happened to me recently is that when I try to go live on Facebook through Zoom, it says I don't have authorization, and that's a brand new thing. Brand new. It's crazy. Okay. You know what we're going to do? We're going to continue, and this will be I'll recorded. Push it out live. Yeah. And then I will push it live to public. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So let us start. Do we, oh, we want to get off and start again? Do we want to stop and start again? I love um, it. It's women power. Yes, there is. It is. Okay, so allow me to start. Lady Jen is a leading expert in building world, world-class teams. And when I say that is not only she works with high-achieving corporation leaders and entrepreneurs, but takes everyone, individuals, especially women, because she specializes in working with women and empowering them to go from six six figures to seven figures. Through her mastermind, uh, she has uh, done private mentorship, group leading, and scaled her business revenue and improved leadership skills all the way to building powerful teams and enabling multiple results in record time. So not only she is a financial services industry for the last four decades, but she was one of the top 200 mortgage or originators and funded over one billion dollars in mortgage loans Mm -hmm. so here's the thing she is the author of not only numerous amazons and speaker author books and everything but her number one book that she talks about and her uh, host of the tv show tell me i can't and i love this title lady jen It's like, dare me and let me show you. So welcome to Real Talk Tuesdays 
and uh, the platform is yours, my lady. Uh, well, it's not the platform isn't mine, but I'm going to let you ask me questions. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, but thank you. I mean, it's it's great to be here. And um, I know that uh, my bio is pretty long and so it can get confusing to read through and, and understand. But, you know, the bottom line is that what I do is I help business owners and entrepreneurs, doctors, big, big part of my business, doctors, all kinds of doctors and corporations, right, corporations learn how to stop working in and on their business and start living above and beyond their business. And, you know, my mentor, Les Brown, says that if you do what's hard, life will be easy. If you do what's easy, life will be hard. And oftentimes we're doing a lot of things very easy and very superficially mm. um, because we don't want to dig in. Um, but what I learned from Les is that it's let's define let's do what's hard. It's not working long, hard hours. That's what we all think we need is, oh, I'll just work more hours and that'll be working hard. That is not working hard. What we want to do is do the hard work, set up the systems, work on your social media, work on your branding, work on your elevator speech, work on your sales pitch, work on your deliverables to your clients, uh, work on your calendar, <laughs> right? And your priority management, work on all of those things so that life can be easy but work on them just for a little while. Dig in deep now so that you can have that easy life. And so I always say, for me, it means work on purpose so you can play with passion. Don't just work. I love that. Work on purpose so you can live by Play passion. with passion. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it means get in, get my work done, be very systematic about it, be very intentional, have priorities, right? Priorities, what needs to get done versus all the little fun things that I could do all day long that take up too much time. Um, work on that and then go dance or go play with my grandbaby who I just stopped playing with a few minutes ago. I had my daughter come over. I said, I need baby time. So he's He's been over here for the last hour and a half and I've been playing with him right before I, you know, started this call and, you know, it puts you in a different frame of mind, you know, compared to how I was before that when my husband and I were arguing about something and, um, you know, and so that, that changes your, your, um, your energy, right? The energy that you bring to anything. So I said to my daughter, bring him over. Let me play for a little bit. I can't come over there, but bring him here. And then I'm right back to working on purpose again, accomplishing everything that I'm going to accomplish today. And, uh, you know, that's the living a life of quality versus having a quality life. And um, for me, that's super important because my mom used to tell me, you know, when I was on the phone with her, we're taking the kids here, we're going there and we're traveling here. We're, you know, and I have this speaking gig and whatever the case may be. And she said, you have such a great quality of life. And I slept on that, that one night that she told me, and I'll never forget it. And I thought, I don't want a quality of life. That's like keeping up with the Joneses. That's like, oh, I need to get a Mont Blanc pen for those of you that remember that, because that was a sign of, of success. If you had a Mont Blanc pen, but once I got the Mont Blanc pen, I thought, well, this is just a pen. And I have to replace it and, it and it leaks all over my purse. And, you know, it was just constant. And I thought, well, that's not the success I want. I want a life of quality, a life where I get in, do my work, and then I can go and play and do whatever I want to do. And to me, that's more important than a quality of life. And I still make money, right? Let's, we all make money, right? We have right. to. So we, to, we get to. <laughs> yeah. So if you could share about your background and what initially drew you to where you are today. I mean, from mortgage and loans and being on that high level, seven figure, eight figure, and being in that top industry as a woman many years ago, yeah. what shifted you to be where you are to being an author, speaker, and coaching yeah. others to reach that level? Yeah, it's a really great question because uh, I don't get asked it that often. So thank you for asking that. Um, it's interesting because all of this that has transpired that where I'm at now would not have happened had I not been a top performer, mm -hmm. had not have happened, it had I not started a podcast. And that's where the two marry. Otherwise, I would be a retired loan officer. So 
what happened was, so, I mean, way back, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but way back, I was known as Jenny who ain't got a penny. My uncle had nicknames for all 36 of us cousins, and mine happened to be Jenny who ain't got a penny. And of course, I didn't quite understand that as a little girl, but I carried a penny in my shoe. And so every time he said that, I would pull it out and go, ha, 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 I got you. I have a penny. But later I figured it out. And it was because my dad was an alcoholic. My mom was a verbal abuser. She was my first bully. And we were the poorest of all the family members. And, you know, we and they didn't go to school and all the, all of that. So um, so he was really saying it a different way and maybe it rhymed and it was fine, but you know, the undertone was, you don't you have, was a, you mean his statement was derogatory and yet you took it in a different way. Right. Right. And you know, he, and, and so, so, um, but one day he said to me, you know, Jenny, the way that life works is what, you know, if your parents are alcoholics, you will be an alcoholic. If your parents mm -hmm. smoke you're going to smoke. If they're poor, you're going to be poor. And that's what hit me and triggered me. And so I set out to a life of proving, well, I'll show you. And this is where tell me I can't comes from, you know, 50 years later, but, but, um, you know, just saying, Hey, I'm going to show you. So I excelled in everything. I was pre-med. I was going to be a cardiologist. And so I was in medical school and then I ended up getting a degree in um, architectural design and construction engineering. Um, so I'm very smart. And um, But I played flute and piccolo in the Colorado Springs Symphony when I was in 11th and 12th grade. I was Miss Colorado Springs and runner-up Miss Colorado. I was a state champion uh, tennis player. I ran track and field. I, did, I was a long-distance runner. I was a cheerleader. Um, I mean, so, you know, I excelled at everything. And then I took that into my life, into my adulthood, and I excelled at everything I did in the workplace. And, you know, after retiring after 35 years and lending, you know, it was either, I have three criteria. <laughs> I will not be in lending at 55. I will fund a billion dollars of loans, and I will not be in the business 40 years. And so I retired uh, 35 years in the business, 54 years old, and, um, a uh, billion dollars in funding. In fact, I funded a billion on a Friday and I went in on Monday and I quit because I had built a bridge. I was ready. I was okay. ready to prepare. So what we talk about, the work that I do, working with the subconscious, tapping to the subconscious mind, it's a mindset reset, right? From the core. That's what I talk about. Mindset reset from the core. So as a girl, tell yeah. me I can't, it fueled you to excel and you kept excelling. So the seeds you planted, the decisions that you made, it's like, you know, so many of us say vision board, but instead of a vision board, you instilled and planted the seed. This yeah. is what I'm going to do. This is, it's like a statement to self. Yes. Yeah. And that's why my show is not called Don't Tell Me I Can't, because to me, that's confrontational. Don't you tell me I can't. This is bring it on. Yeah. Go ahead. Tell me I can't and watch yes. what I do. Tell me I can't and watch me fly. Tell me I can't and get out of my way. Right. And um, and that's why I wrote the book. Tell me I can't, too, because I, I wanted to, you know, really have my thought process there of maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe uh, I should be drinking and smoking Maybe and poor. Maybe I'm not to, wait a minute, hold on, I have aspects. And then going through imposter syndrome, maybe I'm not good enough having good days and bad days to saying, I'm woman, watch me roar. You know, here I go, here I go, hear me roar. And um, so when I, when I got in the top 200 of loan officers in the country, and I did have another trigger, um, you know, climbing this ladder, uh, and I call it walking the concrete balance beam. And we've all done it. We're walking a curb in a parking lot, talking on the phone while our families are doing whatever. But, you know, we're trying to say, hey, our client needs us. So I have to go make this phone call. You know, I have this phone call. And I happened to look into the window, you know, of the restaurant and my family was enjoying themselves. And this was the trigger. This had happened a thousand times. Right. And it would happen many times afterwards as I tried to figure it out. But it, it triggered me like, oh, my gosh, I'm I'm watching this. It was like being on a train and just our life was going by me and I wasn't yeah. participating. I was just a, a look, an onlooker. And um, 
that was the trigger that said something's got to give. I can't work a gazillion hours. I was working hard. I was doing very well. I was in the top 1%, but I wasn't in the top 200 people. 1% 1 is 75,000 people. Wow. Top okay. 200 is different. Now, I wasn't setting out to do top 200. I set out to find a way to do the volume I was doing. And at the time, I was doing $50 million a year. And I would later be doing 100 and more a year, doubling with a life of quality, working four days a week, and I continue mm -hmm. to do that. I refuse to work five or more days a week because I don't want it to, now it's a fear factor, right? It's a mindset breakthrough problem that I have. It's like, if I work that fifth day, I'm gonna get suckered into working that fifth day forever. So I will never work it. And, um, and that's what changed things. And one day I was sitting in my office and I got a plaque in the mail and it said, congratulations, you're in the top 200 loan officers in the country. And I had no idea. And no idea um but that's but that's the sacrifice in yeah. a way uh that because one of my questions is do you believe you have sacrificed some things to be where you are now no i do not anymore <laughs> i do not anymore and i think a lot of people say well you know something's got to give the problem is people live in a world of balance. And when you look at a scale, you're 50, 50, that means you're sacrificing something. So I'm right. never sacrificing. I'm 100% here with you, period, end of story. Right. And when I'm done here, I will be a hundred percent doing whatever else I'm doing. And so I'm, I'm task shifting in a manner that makes, uh, that allows for me to play 100% full out. Mm -hmm. being proud. I'm not tax, task shifting for a blip of a second like a goldfish and getting nothing done and trying to balance. And I'm exhausted. Wouldn't you be exhausted if you're trying to stand on a balance and you're like, exactly. oh, no. right? I was tired. And so I said, enough. I'm not doing the so, balancing act anymore. As a woman, as a wife, as a mother, and now grandma and everything, was mm -hmm. that a decision between... Uh, you and your husband to sit and talk and say, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is what I want. And this is going to be our situation, our life for a while until I do this. Or it was just your aim. It was me. It was me. Yeah, it was completely me. I actually, I mean, some of the leading up to this, all the signs were there, right? All the signs were there for us. The leading up to this, I had done, because this was several years ago, I had sent an email to everyone asking them to describe me in three words, right? And I said, be, be totally honest, describe me in three words. Well, of course, I got back what we all would get back. Oh, you're great. You're lovely. You're smart. You're, you know, all these wonderful things. One person sent back two great things and a third, and he had it on the bottom, and he said, not present. And so I had to get my big girl panties on and I had to call him and find out because I couldn't let this lie, right? I had to confront it. And okay. when I called him, I said, um, hey, Chip, you put on here, you know, not present. Can you help me understand that? Because I feel like I'm always present. You know, I'm like running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Right? I'm always present. Uh, so I thought being present was, and he said, you know, Jen, he goes, you have these huge events. You have these beautiful things as a lender. And then he goes, you're like a bumblebee. You just go from flower to flower or person to person. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, that's cool. Hey, how are you? How are you? Oh, hey, how are you? And he said, I'd rather watch you sit with three people and never acknowledge that I was there than to see you do what you're doing because you don't have any depth to you. And I said, yeah, but it's like a wedding. You know, and yeah, buts, right? It's like a wedding. I want to make sure everybody knows that I appreciate you being there. And he said, everyone appreciates it because you invited them. Now show them that you really have that curiosity for people. And so that next year, my big word was curiosity. Well, it wasn't curiosity. It was be curious. And I said, you know, I have to be present. And I think that that trigger for that year well, that was one year. And then the next year was, I'm not going to be a yes woman. Mm. I'm not doing everything. Because, it, you know, if you want me to do this, I'm happy to do it. But you're only going to get 10% of me because I all I can do is show up and, and give you that. I can't give you 100%. Uh, I just can't. And so I learned that uh, I had to say no in order for people to get 100% of me. Um, you know, and not be a yes woman. And I think those two years triggered 
the awareness for me that triggered ultimately how my whole life changed, you know, and how my production went up and my hours went down. And, um, and that led to people asking me to speak on stage. How in the heck did you do it? How'd you build this big team? Um, and so, then eventually which, I had to make a decision. Yeah. So, which is a great lead to my question. Who was the first person? Because we've seen each other in so many different uh, events, venues, yeah. uh, from mm -hmm. top leaders to, and you've been on stages, we've been together. Um, who was the first person that helped you, guided you, mentored you, or gave you the stage for you to speak? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because I see, I had been part of my sales in lending was education and training. So mm. I didn't want to go out and do one to one to one to one. I wanted to do one to many, and I still I still advocate for that with my all of my clients who whatever they do for a living, because um, life is too short. We don't have time to go onesie twosie everywhere. So one to many is it just a better way? So I'd already been speaking and teaching, and again, I was a performer. Remember, I played right. for people. I was a beauty pageant person. So I was already a cheerleader. So all of that was easy for me. So public speaking and groups and everything, you're, you're, you're comfortable on stage. Yeah, you know, second nature. yeah, that was second nature for me. So, um, you know, initially it was all in the lending business, but there was no one who took my hand and helped me do that. I would say um, if anyone started me, understanding different concepts about being on stage and whatnot, it would be Amon a guy. Um, that started with Amon. Uh, Gerald Rogers uh, brought in a less salesy approach and more approach that was more like my personality, which is, you know, if this resonates with you, reach out, let's have a conversation and see if this is, uh, you know, if we can work together, if we can complement one another. Um, that is more my style. And um, so he helped me with that. Um, and, you know, so I mean, and then it just led to another, you know, Paul Fink was another person that led to Jay Saunders. Um, then Greg Reed was helpful. Then Dave, David Corbin was helpful. Um, you know, it just continues to go. Uh, Kane Minkus is another one. Um, and now Keurig Ashley is my main coach now. So I have, it just sort of, you know, goes along with what I'm needing uh, to help. So I think there's so many people you, it takes a village. There's exactly. never, right. You, just and less, less around, of course, you know, you less. touched on something, even as a coach, as a leader, as someone who, ha who coaches others, you have your own coaches as well. Yeah. And I would say, you know, not, uh, Clint Arthur is another one of mine. He's, he's really right. great. I don't want, I just don't want to leave anybody out right now, but, uh, but the thing is, I won't coach with someone who doesn't have their own coach. Because let's, then let's they're that again to our, let's say that again that. to our viewers. I will not coach someone who has not had a coach or who's never been coached. No, I will not coach with a coach higher from me, up from me. I will not coach with someone who doesn't themselves have a coach. You know, so Tony, Robbins, Tony Robbins has a coach. He has multiple coaches because one of his yes. coaches is mine. Okay. So, That's yeah. awesome because uh, if I were to ask you, um, do you have a philosophy by what you live by? You just gave me a bit of a philosophy, but do you have another philosophy that you live by? Like a, either a philosophy or a ritual, a daily oh, ritual? Yeah. Several. <laughs> Several. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just, I mean, that's just in the coaching world, you know, like someone will come up to me and say, you know, or I'll go to them and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm looking for a coach to help me with X, Y, and Z. But before we even have a conversation about you getting all excited that you might get money from me, who are you coaching with? Mm. They're not coaching with someone. I don't even meet them because they're telling me that they've capped their life. They've capped their personal growth. They feel like they know it all. And that doesn't work for me. That doesn't work at all. Richard Dreyfus has a coach. 
And we, we both know him. I won't say who it is, but Richard Dreyfus has a coach. And, you know, he's on the phone with, with, with Richard Dreyfus all the time. And I'm second because he'll go, hold on, Richard's calling. And I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs> uh, and he has a coach, right? And so I think that that's just very shallow. So, yes, that's a, the philosophy. Now, in life, I mean, I've got all kinds of things. I believe that um, you should live your legacy while you're building it. I think that uh, so often we're saying, once I have this success, then I can live my life, then I can travel, then I can do all those wonderful things. And that is not the case. I don't I don't believe in that at all. Um, I ran across a, I'm looking for it right now, but I ran across a, um, a sign that says the same thing as live your legacy while you're building it. And I just ran across it the other day, so I have a picture of it, but I have to get it out because I haven't memorized it yet. And um, I'm just so excited about this, this as well, because it says the same thing. But having said that, while well, I'm looking for it, um, you know, living your legacy while you're building. I think the other thing is create a, a work life that makes life work, right? Create a work life that makes life work instead of us. And I've, I've shared this on stage quite often is if you think about a tire and a wheel on a car, the wheel is the steel. Mm -hmm. and the rubber, right? The wheel, we focus so much on business and career. And then what happens is our tire, our life is secondary and it gets nails and it gets treaded on, it gets flat and we get divorced and our health is awful. And we have, I mean, you name it, it's a problem. So what if we inverted that? What if we, the inside is our life? This is the most important. This is you know, arms of steel, if you want to call it like a financial, professional, physical, all those pieces, the wheel of life, right? It's steel. And then our business becomes the tire and it becomes a four wheel tire, right? That It's ready to go over any terrain on our way to success. Instead of a haphazard business or a haphazard life, both of these are strong enough to sustain all by themselves. That is then, beautiful. And then what's worse is if you see a tire and it's a beautiful hubcap, right? Like, oh, I like that. And the hubcap falls off. <laughs> and it's a fake cover. Mm. Your business is, oh, my business is great. Until the hubcap falls off and you're like, Ew. Ew, it's not as good as you thought it was, right? So, so no hubcaps, only okay. wheels. So if someone is struggling right now. Yeah. Let's say one of our viewers is watching this and wants to be in touch with you or wants a coach and they are struggling. The business is struggling and but they have a great vision. They have a great creativity, but somehow they have not been able to turn or turn this wheel or they, they can't even do anything about it. There's too many nails. They've. Too many things. Too many flat tires. Yeah. <laughs> right? Too many right. flat tires. Yeah. What can you say? How can you guide or coach or say something that starts turning this wheel in a different path? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I, I uh, just want to make sure that I that I express this too. I think that we use the term coach very loosely. I feel there's a difference between a coach and a mentor. I'm not a coach. I'm a mentor. And while they do similar things, a coach knows the game and tells you what to do and inspires you to be able to achieve more in your life. A mentor knows the game, inspires you, can tell you what to do. However, they've walked the walk. They know what it feels like. They know when you're going to encounter problems and challenges. They know what the mindset is of someone who's in business, who's encountering these hiccups. And so I like to say that I mentor people. So the first place it starts from, and so I have another saying that I say, which is mindset plus mechanics equals momentum. You can't have just, you know, I'm going to throw this out into the universe and I'm going to manifest that my business is going to grow. That's not going to work because at some point you have to have the work. You have to do the work. You also cannot just do the work and not have the right mindset to be able to see when things are, when challenges come up, that it's time to take a turn to time and, and maybe not at 180, but just a little one degree turn, right? That will make a big difference. 
And okay. so that's where the momentum happens. So what I do is I start with that mindset and I'm not a mindset coach. I just start with the mindset of what are your core values? What are your boundaries? And I do this from my own experiences. My family was number one. It always has been. Well, God first, right? So faith first, family, stability, integrity, and accountability. Those are my five core values. And when I ask you, what are your core values? And someone responds to me by saying, um, uh, family, would that be a core value? Is that a core value? I don't know. Family. It's, it has to be a conviction and non mm. It can't be a question. And if, in fact, your family is a core value of yours, then why are you working till 11 o'clock at night? Now, look, I'm a mentor because I did it. I get it. I said my family was a core value, and then I worked till 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> right. But there was a time where I said enough boundaries. Let's put some boundaries. Let's determine what those core values are, and then let's put boundaries around them. And I promise you, the people that recognize and respect your, your boundaries will be the people that are attracted to you. The rest of them, let them go. Just let them go, let them go. And so that's where we start as core values, you know, having the vision that you want in your company um, that inspires you. I'm not interested in motivating anybody. That's short-lived and it's exterior. It's an outside job. You got to call me, you get motivated. You're not, you're not inspired enough to grow your business because it's exactly. going to hurt, right? It's going to hurt on the way. There's a, there is a fine line of a difference between motivation and inspiration. And Absolutely. so when people ask me, do you do a motivation or inspirational Ooh. talk? And I say, yeah. I'm more of a inspiring you yeah. than motivating you. It's yeah. not the momentum. I inspire you and then we dig in. <laughs> well, and people say that, oh, are you a motivational speaker? And I'm like, I hope not. Oh, God, I hope not. I hope I don't just like give people shots of, you know, something and then it all dissipates later and then they need the drug again. I want to give you the drug that you'll have for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's sort of like dieting, a next diet, a different diet, and this kind of diet. I need all these motivational diets or you could just learn how to eat properly and that's inspiration. <laughs> and you don't need a diet. So Actually, I have a better philosophy for that one is the one that I work with with my clients. It's not what you eat. It's what's weighing you down that I help you really. Oh, yeah. Excellent. I love that. Yeah. And, and that's that's what we're talking about here is digging deep to find out what charges you up. What mm -hmm. excites you to get up every single morning and nothing will get in your way. Don't tell me I can't right? or tell me I can't. However you want to say it in that context is get out of my way because I'm so inspired about what I'm doing that nothing, nothing will stop me. Not a computer breaking. Hey, I'll get on my phone if I have to. Nothing's going to stop me um, from, from getting where I want to go. But we have to know where it is. And like I said earlier, it can't necessarily be a Mont Blanc pen. It can't be, I want to make a million dollars because that's what everybody says I should do. What is your definition of success? My definition is... Like, I love what you just said. What if we can sign a million dollar check and give it as a, um, a donation? Now that inspires me. Yeah. And that's, see, and that's, that's what's so great about life is that that for you, that's an inspiration for you is, Hey, I want to make X amount of dollars so that I have the ability to write a million dollar check to a charity that, that means a lot to me for someone else. It might be time. It just might be time, right? Success for me. I have a client who said, um, this was years ago. He said to me, I don't want to close more than a certain amount of business every month. I don't want to make more than a certain amount because it will rob me from my three children. And I think they were all under six or something. And one month he exceeded that. And I called him and I apologized. I said, I'm so sorry. I apologize that you, you made more money than you wanted to. Because I, I was very clear about making sure that we, we, you know, constructed this business that does just this so that you can have that. And he said, no, no, it was fine. Now I have a new one. Now it's double that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right. But, but it, I mean, I wanted him to know that I was hearing him because he was, you know, he had this limit for himself. I just got him to the limit 
with half the time, half the everything, right? Half the oh, pain in the butt, the stress, the everything. And he realized it's possible. It's possible mm -hmm. to go further than I ever thought. And so my coaching is that well, your dreams are too low. Your dreams are too high. They're too much about money. They're too much about time. They're too much about playing. They're your dreams. I just know where I'm taking you. I, I already knew. Okay, I'm going to play this game with him. But uh, yeah, so we're going to start with the mindset. And then we're going to start looking at the mechanics. Because so often um, as entrepreneurs... Um, and I'm speaking to entrepreneurs only, you know, and, and business people. Um, we were really good at our at the, the skill that we have. And we thought, well, we'll just have that company. We'll make a company out of it. But we're not good at management and leadership. Um, and we lack those skills. So as a result, we hire, fire, hire, fire, hire, fire, and then finally give up and just say, I'll just work all the long hours. But it's not sustainable. And of course, then happiness starts dripping out of you. And you're like, why am I doing this? So we make sure that the mechanical pieces that are, are required to scale, and that's why I'm known as a scaling architect, because we want to make sure the mechanical pieces are there after we've reset your mindset. Okay. So two questions. Uh, and I don't want to, I want to make sure that we are on time for you yes. honoring your I heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How did you get the title Lady Jen? Is that oh, Dr. Bentley? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I was nominated by someone else who's in, uh, we're in the Royal House of Cappadocia. So, you know, we all know the England, you know, the England, not England, but the King, I want to say Queen, but now it's King Charles, right? Um, England, it's the Royal House of Windsor. And right. so I'm, I'm in a different royal house. It's the Royal House of Cappadocia. And inside of that house, um, and I'm a member of that, and inside of that house, I'm also a member of the Royal Order of Constantine the Great and St. Helen. And it's the oldest royal order in the world. And it, we weren't Templars, but you, it goes all the way back to there. We were established in 360 or 380 AD. I can't remember right now. And... Um, so, you know, we have knights and, well, obviously knights for years and then dames later. So, um, so I'm a dame. I just chose, I chose and can choose to go by lady or by dame. And, um, we are, um, we are a, uh, order of faith, hope, and love of charitable giving of chivalry. And our focus is on helping, um, homeless women and children and trafficked children, uh, people generally, but mostly children, um, in making sure that they are, you know, taken care of. That's what we do. And so we are building homes all over the world um, where they will come and rest, have um, nursing care, you know, having doctor uh, mental care, all of the things that they need um, to get going and get back in the world. So um, it, it really was interesting because I, I was caught off guard by it. I uh, wasn't planning for it, wasn't looking for it, didn't buy it. You don't buy this title. Um, but it, honestly, it's just an extension of what I already do because one exactly. of the criteria is philanthropy and charity, and that's what I'm really involved in. And so it's just an extension of, of what I'm already doing. So that's how that came about. Yeah. And what is the most meaningful gift that you have received? Um, hmm, the gift, I would say it goes back to my uncle, right? When he called me Jenny, who ain't got a penny and told me that I was going to be like my parents. I think that, um, he's alive now. He's 90 years old. Um, you know, it, it's touch and go sometimes, but he's alive and well. And, uh, you know, I think that that was the biggest gift because in hindsight, I believe I would have been that, um, and here's why. I have a brother who is 12 and a half years younger than me and he is homeless and he refuses to come live with me. He refuses to let me help and he, he just wants money and I won't give him money and he's not a drug addict. He doesn't drink, but he was conditioned to be exactly what my mom and dad were. And he didn't have someone tell him what my uncle told me and that made all the difference in the world. And you didn't tell him the same thing? No, because um, I do now. But uh, when 
he was at that age, because there's a 12 year difference. So think about it. Oh, yes. When I'm 19, he's in kindergarten and whatever. And I'm already starting my life. I got married at 19. Yeah. My husband and I have been married for yeah, four years. We've already formed our patterns and the blueprint. Yeah, and I, was already, I was still struggling right at 19, even, even at 45. I was still yeah, trying to prove and, and mm -hmm. then, you know, involved in me. And so by the time, you know, I, I got it and figured it out, it almost was too late. He's, he's dug his feet in and that's how he wants to be. And, and, and I love him and that's okay. You know, it's okay. But, um, I'm always going to be there for him, but I will not send him money. I just won't do it. He knows that. So he doesn't ask me for money. <laughs> right. He fix things for him so i'm like okay well, i'll do the that things that i talk to my what some of my clients is like it's not always about drugs but we got to stop enabling the ones we want for bingo. them to see. bingo yeah bingo that's it and he's perfectly capable he's just stubborn and that's where it, that's where it's at he's just absolutely stubborn and stuck in his ways and now what i'm 60 so he's what 48 you know, there's not much I can do to change him at this point. And I just discovered this about myself 15 years ago. So it wasn't, you know, and at that time my mom was around and she was doing the enabling. So, you know, yeah. it's an unfortunate thing. It really is. It's unfortunate. But, um, you know, I still love him. I still love him to death. I care what happens. I pray about him all the time. I talk to him all the time. Um, but I just, I can't succumb to the woe is me and the this, that, and the other. And, it's just, um, you know, I've moved on and I can't go backwards. And I, this is why the rear view mirror is tiny and the front is big <laughs> so that you can see what is possible rather than living in the past. And I just can't live in the past. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's, awesome. that's what's happening there. Yeah. So I want to say thank also one thing is like, thank you very much for saying yes and being a part of the powerful she book as well. And it means a lot when you said yes, I had tears in my eyes. It's like Lady Jen said yes. Oh. And <laughs> I know because it's like, you know how we get to see a lot of people yeah. and, and we sometimes it's like a bumblebee. We're at different events and everything. We see each other, we say hello, we hug and we move on. Yeah. But how I got to admire who you are, we spent quality time on the boat. Present. Being present. Yes, on our, on our boat, which, by the way, we did this past weekend again. Uh, I missed it. But on that boat, we got, there were other people, but I was, I was the one with the phone watching and talking and not necessarily on the phone. I was just using it that as a metaphor that you said you were on the phone and your family was in the restaurant, mm -hmm. but I was watching and we were involved. We started talking about so many things, personal things, business mm -hmm. things uh, about the boat, how to rent a boat instead of buying a boat. So it was a whole different way of who you are. And then at the, at the meeting and the chair and who you became and being a dancer, which is core because I used to dance. <laughs> Lady Jen became Jen. Yes. So, yes. and that's who you are. And I admire you, my lady, for everything that you have created and you have established and you are doing not only for your family, but for so many. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's my, you know, it's my honor to participate. And, you know, I wanted to participate in September, whenever it was, and I couldn't get everything in my act together um, at your event. And hopefully we'll have a chance in the future. But, uh, you know, I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing for women. I love that you're trying, you know, to, to help that you are not trying, but that you're helping women and, you know, sit, letting them see the real themselves, the real, the, you know, them. Um, notice I don't say empower. Uh, and, and I don't, by the way, it's very, I, I don't like it when people say they empower women because I think we are. We just haven't, we're not aware of it yet. We already are empowered. Um, we're just revealing it. We're revealing it to people. So I'd like to leave with this quote because this is what I love leaving with, which sure. is this. 
We flatter those we scarcely know. We please the fleeting guests, but we deal many a thoughtless blow to those we love the best, including ourselves. So be good to yourselves, be good to your family because they're there to support you. Be good to the people that work for you because they're there to support you. And remember to not be, you know, please all the fleeting guests and then turn right around and yell at somebody in the house because mm -hmm. women, we're like that. We smile and put that mask on in the front and then we turn right around and say, you shouldn't have this, that, and the other. So I'm just asking you to be nice to yourself and to your family. And thank you. Thank you. And my last question, please complete this uh, statement. Lay Jen is. Lady Jen is, um, ooh, I got to do it fast because we just went over 45 minutes. Uh, Lady Jen is, and there's a lot of things that are coming up. There's a lot of things. I'm just, I mean, to give you just anything, I would say. Um, I am. Aware. I'm aware. Beautiful I'm aware. ending. Thank you so much. And for our viewers, thank you so much for being present, being here. Um, definitely, please leave comments and messages, and we'll definitely get back to you. Uh, Jen, how can we reach you? Yeah, the best way is go to jenduplessis.com, and I, that's all you have to do. And I know you'll spell it out and put it in there. <laughs> I will put everything in there. there. Kinds, yeah, like, all kinds of resources there, and you can learn about our programs and speaking and all that good stuff. Awesome. Thank you. And for mm -hmm. our viewers, God bless you. May you have a wonderful uh, holidays. Merry Christmas, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from a week ago, two weeks ago, even a year ago, click right here.